Now it's time to hear from our speaker this afternoon, Butler County Farm Bureau Rick McNary. Now Rick is not a farmer nor a rancher, but I can tell you he values immensely the work that you do and we are excited and honored to have him speak to you today. Rick is the Vice President of Pri Private and Public Partnerships for the Outreach Program, which is an international nonprofit that, that provides both short-term relief and long-term development opportunities for hungry people and is known for its efforts to help those in need. Part of their work is organizing food packing events across the nation. Those efforts are not for the faint of heart or body. Um, if you wonder how that goes, just ask Ron Betson, our third district administrator, who's still recovering from his own experience in that effort. Rick is also the author of Hunger Bites, Bite Size Stories of Inspiration, Voices on the Prairie, and The Cows of Hob Hobson's Pond, mostly true stories of growing up in Kansas. He also writes for our monthly membership magazine, Kansas Living. Rick and his wife, Christine, reside in Potland. Please help me welcome Rick McNary. When they asked me to speak today, my first thought was, what? I'm not a farmer or rancher. And although I'm not a farmer or rancher, I have learned a few things about you farmers and ranchers. As I've spent the last three years writing stories about you for Kansas Living Magazine. And that began after a friend of mine who was the FFA Government Relations Director in D.C. asked me if I knew much about FFA. And I said, mm, not really. After he peeled me up after the carpet, after knocking me down, he said, you need to go to an FFA convention. And so I went to Louisville four years ago and met 65,000 bright, beautiful, and brilliant blue-coated young people who I think we need to just go ahead and turn our country over. gave me hope for the future, but as I sat there listening to them, I kept hearing this phrase, we need to tell our story better. And so on my drive home, I thought, well, I like to write. Maybe I can write some stories about my Kansas farmers and ranchers. As an outsider looking in, I'm not an ag guy. And so I called up Megan Kramer, and she said, well, yeah, we can try that, and here it is three, ye three years later. I've sat at your dining room tables and sipped cups of coffee. I've trundled through your barnyards and I've bounced down your graveled roads. And what I have learned about you both astonishes me and inspires me. There is no group of people I admire more in our country than you. In fact, one of my goals in life is to be your biggest cheerleader. Now, I won't bring pom-pom. And I'm not about to try a cartwheel because I would end up both in the hospital and on a YouTube video. <laughs> but I will grab the biggest megaphone that I can and cheer you on. Because I want to tell you things about yourself today that you probably don't even know you do. And things about you that you're doing that you don't even know that you are. That makes such a huge difference in the world. And what I've discovered is other Americans who, who have read my stories about you agree with me. And the things they say to me gives me confidence to say, I believe today I'm speak on, speaking on behalf of millions of Americans who unfortunately are all too silent often, but admire you and respect you for what you do. My purpose today is not to wow you with a speech. My purpose today is that you wake up tomorrow morning with a greater sense of clarity for how important you are to our world and with renewed courage to, to face and fight those incredible battles that you fight with hope that shines bright even in the darkest hours. You see, I really didn't understand how important farmers were until I came face to face with global hunger. 
In 2001, I took a mission team from my church down to Central America in a, an impoverished village. A little five-year-old girl stumbled out of a house made of mud and rocks and tin and plastic. And her hair was red from malnutrition. Her tummy was distended. Her dress was on backwards. And she began begging, and then she ended up in my arms. By the time it was done, she had thrown her arms around my neck and said, Feed me. I'm starving. And from that moment on, I vowed I would do everything I could for the rest of my life to feed hungry people. And those travels have taken me to the farthest reaches of the earth. I've traveled under the protection of the Colombian military as we tried to get food back into the jungle, but the FARC rebels at the time were ambushing relief, relief efforts, and the military said, we need to stop, and I said, that's okay, I'm good with that. Don't want to get shot. I've also been in the largest refugee camp in the world where thousands of incredibly emaciated refugees were fleeing the horrors. We were 20 miles from the Somalia border. And most of the refugees that were arriving were women and children because the men and sons, the fathers and sons, had been either abducted or killed on the journey over by El Shabaab. I've taken life-giving and life-saving food into the mountains of Central America, Nicaragua and Honduras, where hurricanes had just devastated entire villages. I've looked into the haunting eyes of children in the second largest slum in the world, in Kibera, Kenya, where millions of people live on, in, in tin rusted sheds and on lean-tos. I've even been escorted by Haitian gang leaders through the serpentine paths of the tent cities in, in Haiti. And there I met women who, who made, baked, and ate cakes made of mud. But the most impactful moment was in the Andes of South America. We had sent about a million meals down, and my son and I went afterwards to check on everything. And as we tumbled out of the mountains into this ancient city of Hakura, they met us with a parade on a Tuesday afternoon, a parade in our honor. I was astonished, but as we walked down those narrow cobblestone sto stones of streets of that old city, the mayor spoke to me and he said, you know, those, those farmers, the people whom the hills own, are our family and they're our friends, and we love them. But we also know, without them, we starve. In all of my travels, and all of the places that I've been where there are an incredibly hungry people, I've learned this one fundamental lesson. When there's no food, Food is the number one obsession. If you emptied our grocery stores this afternoon, your farm bill would be passed at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And within a few days, you would have people in suburbia and urban areas, areas knocking at your door, tearing down your fences, and ripping apart your grain elevators to get at food. You would understand how valuable you are if the grocery stores were empty. I have been a witness to food riots on numbers of occasions, and I'll tell you, it's one of the most frightening things that you can watch. We cannot live without you. Now, I want to tell you some things about yourself that you might not know. So the world that I live in is called the hunger space, and that's that intersection of corporations and nonprofits and government agencies, anyone trying to figure out how to end global hunger. And in that space, there are two main concepts. There's relief and development. Relief is what we know as give a man a fish. Development is teach a man the fish. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Kansas has a, a global reputation for being a leader in humanitarian relief. Did you know that? I discovered it in that refugee camp in Dadaab, Kenya. I was standing there looking at the sacks of food that had the USAID stamp on it, and underneath it it said, Food for Peace, a gift of the American people. 
And Ambassador Tony Hall, a legendary figure in the hunger space, was with me, and he walked up beside me, and he knew I was from Kansas, and he said, well, you know that was started by a bunch of Kansas farmers, don't you? <laughs> really? And sure enough, in 1957, in Cheyenne County, the Cheyenne County Farm Bureau went to Congress and said, why don't you buy some excess grain off of us and feed hungry people around the world as an act of goodwill? The Food for Peace program is the single most enduring and successful humanitarian relief program that has ever been developed in the world, and it came from Kansas. <laughs> You've fed billions of people. In fact, that was just reauthorized under the Global Food Security Act within the last six weeks in Congress in a truly bipartisan effort. And thank God for our Kansas legislators who led the way on that. But you also lead the space in agricultural food security and innovation. Did you know that? See, it's other countries that I go to and they say, you're from Kansas? Don't they have that food security thing that they're building there in Kansas somewhere about an in bath or something like that? Just a couple miles up the road, you have a premier facility in the world for protecting food chains and food supplies and food security and preventing, preventing food terrorism. Here in Kansas, right up the road from you. And did you know that Kansas State University has won over a hundred million dollars from USAID Feed the Future Innovation Labs in the last few years? So they have innovation labs on wheat genome, uh, sorghum and millet, post-harvest loss reduction, and sustainable intensification. Only one other university has won more. You lead the way. You have a global, a global reputation for innovation. And one thing that I have learned is that my stereotypes of you have been shattered as well. I grew up in the country, but not on the farm. I was a kid you hired at three cents a bale in the summer to haul hay. That's why I'm not a farmer. <laughs> but you might wear your blue jeans and your flannel shirts and might have a little barnyard on your boot every now and then. But you're scientists and you're CEOs and you're mathematicians, your financial geniuses, your real estate experts, your policy wonks, your technology geeks, your carpenters, your conservationists, and above all, your community leaders. I know of no other profession where people possess as many individual talents as you all do. Now you might call it you wear different hats, or you might be jacks or jills of all trades. I don't refer to you that way at all. I say you are experts in multiple disciplines. You're not good at one thing, you're good at a hundred things. There's no other profession like that. The Malthusian principle that global production of food and the world population will peak at some point in time, that year is 2050, as you know. And agriculture has been called upon to increase production by 75% in those next 30 years. And for those of us who live in that hunger space, we have full confidence that you'll do that. Do you know how much trust the world really has in you? You are the tapestry that weaves our communities together. I was in Ohio a while back in prison, not, not as an inmate, but as <laughs> I was, the governor's office had funded a bunch of meal packaging events with the inmates. And a journalist from Columbus came out and she had finished interviewing me and she said, I'm so excited. Tomorrow morning I'm working on one of the best stories I've had in 40 years. She said, I'm going to the Western Ohio border and there's like 50 trucks full of farming and ranching supplies showing up there and they're headed to Kansas for wildfire relief. And I started laughing and I said, 
I know exactly where that's going, and I know the people that have made all of this happen. And I was so excited, and she said, you know, people in agriculture don't realize that they understand community better than anyone else in the world. They understand it. They get it. They understand community. And if you were to ask me and a lot of my colleagues in the hunger space what it takes to fix global hunger, we would all say the same thing. It has to be done in the context of community. And that's why I fundamentally believe this, and I will until the day I die, you are the solution to ending global hunger. And I believe it can be done. Furthermore, your courage is exemplary. People who have courage often don't realize they have it, except for those of us on the outside going, I don't have that. I could not be a farmer. The courage that you have is exemplary. I know of no other industry that has as many friends turn adversaries as you do. Take Mother Nature, for example. One minute she gives you nice rain and your crops grow, and then poof, here comes the deluge and washes your topsoil into the creek. And then she puts her nose in the air and just dries up for a year or two or three or four or five or six at a time. And it's like she can't stop tormenting you. You know, it's like 70 degrees one day and the next day they have I-70 shut down. <laughs> you know, for the rest of us, we're like, oh cool, that's a snow day. We get out of school to work for that day. But for you, it might spell financial ruin. And then there's bugs. Bugs are just a pest to me. But you have bugs that you like, the bees that pollinate your plants. And then I made the mistake of Googling insects that are harmful to crops. Holy cow. And there were pictures of them. They were cre I mean, it was like looking at the FBI's most wanted list. <laughs> like, this is what farmers have to put up with. And then, and then there's plants. You guys are experts at growing plants. Nobody does it better. Then there's this thing called a pigweed. I had no idea how big of an enemy pigweed is to you. Now when I drive by and look at a field and I see a pigweed thing in there, I think, that's just like the devil himself going into your church and trying to make converts. <laughs> I had no idea how big a battle it is that you fight pigweed. And then there's government. Government, of course, can be your ally. Or they can make your life incredibly miserable. And I have to hand it to you. As an outsider looking in, that rubber ducky thing was brilliant because it made a bunch of pencil pushers in Washington, D.C. that don't know the difference between a bull and a steer made to look like the north end of a southbound mule. <laughs> your marketing people did a fantastic job with that. And then there, of course, are your Goliaths, corporations and anti-farm activists who deliberately lie about you just so they can make money. And they play upon the fears of the American people. Like the Hunt's ketchup commercial, panning out over a sea of tomatoes and inferring that somehow their ketchup doesn't use any GMO tomatoes. <laughs> That's so wrong. And don't even get me started on the 16 million people that think that Chocolate milk comes from brown cows. <laughs> and by the way, when I read that research, so you know, I have now six grandchildren. I started my own little grandkids. They're the McNary Cousins. And we had the McNary Cousins farm and ranch tour. We started that this summer. Just, they live in the city. I want them to know their milk doesn't come from, cow, from chocolate or brown cows. You got me. Well, one of the eight-year-olds decided that farm and ranch tour looks a whole lot like fart. So now we have this thing in our family that we do this tour every year. I admire your courage. I don't have it. Neither really do 98% of the rest of the people who live in America. You're the 2% that is feeding the 100%. I'm like the mayor of Pakora. 
I feel this way. You are the people whom our lands own. And without you, we starve. If you get discouraged, call and I will cheer you up. If I can't do it over the phone, if I can't do it in an email, I'll show up and tell you how many wonderful things there are that you're doing that you don't even know about. I, I won't do a cartwheel. I won't attempt that. I won't bring pom-poms. There are just some things you can't unsee when those happen. And I also recently discovered that there was a Kansas State Farm Bureau song, and I play guitar a little bit. If you like, I can bring my guitar along, and we can strum a few bars. And I really like that part in the chorus about, oh, happy days, oh, joyful days are the days that we see. I could do that, but I have a better idea. Why don't you just watch this video instead? Stories bright with memories of the rolling plains of Kansas that could not hold staff out for a day. Hope the brain now grown in Kansas. But there may be the spacious sky, the sturdy strength, the statehood cries for honor. Drills play beneath the plains of Kansas, where once the buffalo wallowed deep, and next in line the bleeding sheep. But now the roaring plains are seen above the plains of Kansas. So we'll be happy as we grow. Numbers for State Farm Bureau. Thank you. 